Greetings everybody and welcome to our program. Today is 16 June 2021, the day that we celebrate the day of the African child. In studio today I have a number of guests who are going to introduce themselves so that we go deeper into this particular day. The theme for the day of the African child this year is 30 years after the adoption of the charter accelerate the implementation of Agenda 2040. So in this conversation, we want to establish where we are as African children. We also want to establish if the future that we desire is in any way in sight. Allow me to ask my guests to introduce themselves so that we can start this conversation. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Revolutionary Greetings, uh, Sister Yvonne. Greetings, viewers. My name is Comrade Dostalos. I'm an ordinary citizen. An ordinary citizen, indeed. Over to you. Okay, good, a good afternoon, viewers. Uh, my name is uh, Stanley Manyenga. I'm the youth chairperson of Harare uh, Province MDC Alliance. A cry for democratic rights in most African countries like Zimbabwe, have always led to the violation of human rights and manipulation of people. My name is Elem Tizamip, I'll be representing the academia. Thank you. Okay. Excellent, thank you so much. So my guests today, I'll start with you, Helen. What do you understand when we say today is the day of the African child? What is that to you? Okay. The day of the African child is a day where we intend to realize the human rights and child rights to be more specific of Africa. We take to, we take to cognizance not what human rights are in Zimbabwe. We try to liaise the political legislative frameworks in Zimbabwe, trying to align them with the international framework. So in Zimbabwe, we still have a lot to do in terms of attaining child rights. Excellent. And uh, to you, um, the provincial chairperson of the MDC Alliance, what do you understand as young people when we say we are commemorating the Day of the African Child? What does that mean to you as the MDC Alliance? Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, my sister Yvonne. Uh, when we talk of June 16 as a political party representing the young people, we remember that June 16, uh, uh, June 16 uh, is a commemoration that happened in uh, South Africa, whereby the students or the young people uh, got together and decided to, to, to fight for their rights. So when we look uh, at Zimbabwean situation, this is whereby we, look, uh, we take ourselves as the youth and try to figure out what are the problems are there today for the young people? You look at the education system, the jobs system in Zimbabwe, the legislative system in Zimbabwe, all sort of things in Zimbabwe. So this is the day where we come uh, to our senses as youth uh, to think about the situation in our future. Right. Thank you. And you, um, Comrade Ostalus, what does the Day of the African Child represent to you? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, as a student of history, the Day of the African Child takes me to 16 June 1976 in Soweto in South Africa where students um, realizing what uh, Franz Fanon was writing in Algeria that each generation must out of relative obscurity discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. They chose the former that we have discovered our mission in South Africa against um, white secular um, racist uh, regime um, that as young people we are tired um, and they resisted um, dictatorship of the white men um, and uh, more than um, 300 up to 700 um, you know, um, young people were killed uh, resisting uh, what began uh, to be a revolution to liberate South Africa. So as Africans and Zimbabweans in particular, we celebrate this day for the following reasons. Number one is that we celebrate the spirit of activism that young people are and uh, at all metro times are agents of change. Number two, 
we celebrate this day fundamentally because of um, people to people solidarity that we are Africans and young people in the entire globe must give each other solidarity that's why we stand with the oppressed people uh, in Burkina Faso we stand with young people in Western Sahara and other uh, uh, countries that are suffering uh, from uh, colonialism in the post-independent Africa and the world at large. So we celebrate this day also thirdly because of our ideological inclination for us in the democratic movement, as the commander said, where social democratic alternative and one of the social democratic values is justice. Um, the other one is solidarity, the other one is freedom. So the Soweto uprising is a symbol of the quest and call for freedom in the entire generations of history. So across different streams, we celebrate this day today to realize the efforts of young people in liberating African societies because every generation has its own liberators and we are the modern day liberators. That's why we celebrate this day to learn from the June 16th spirit of resistance and activism so that we chart a sustainable path for Zimbabwe in general and uh, uh, our community in particular. Thank you. Right, so the day of the African child is a day that we celebrate activism of young people as seen by the Soweto uprising uh, back in 1976. Right, so today um, we want to look at Agenda 2040 because that's where our theme is generating everything from, that there is need for that commitment. So what is Agenda 2040? So the goal of this agenda was meant to elaborate on Agenda 2063 that's basically looking at the, um, at the rights of children. So it is there to elaborate on aspects of Agenda 2063 relating to children and accelerate efforts towards the implementation of the African Children's Charter. Importantly, it aims to restore the dignity of African children and improve their lives on the continent. So the question is, 2021, have we as Africans made sure that the rights of the African child are upheld? Where are we today? When this whole agenda was put on mo in motion, there were questions and there were concerns that continue to rise in Africa. But we want to look at today in Africa, in Zimbabwe, in your community, in your neighborhood and ask, are the children's hearts being upheld? If you're just joining us, we are talking to young people in Zimbabwe on the day of the African child today, 16 June, and we are commemorating this day under the theme that I've specified and it will be there on your screen right now. We want to look at that commitment to aspirations that have been raised in Agenda 2040. Helen, as an academia and as somebody who is uh, passionate about children's rights, when you look at Zimbabwe today, do you feel that in any way we have made any strides in the protection of children's rights across the board, not just political, but even socially? In Zimbabwe, we've seen young people being uh, taken and killed for ritual purposes. We have seen our schools being closed down, even vaccinations just taking place, uh, you know, in mass, sometimes without the knowledge of parents and etc. Do you feel that the rights of the African child has been and is being, uh, be, is being upheld. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. I would want to say that uh, in the context of Zimbabwe and most African countries, we have actually played a plea. We had actually come to a point where we should kick start the, to, to kickstart the realization of child rights. What I have in mind is that um, the, the political background in which we live in. We need to consider the economic background too that we live in. And largely we need to consider the global background that we are in. When we have children having their rights being, when we have children's rights being uh, realized in other countries or globally, does not necessarily mean that in our own context we have child rights being, being realized. Let's take for instance, 
would you agree with me if I say that uh, is independence an act of democracy or is independence democracy? We cannot talk about child rights today in a state where we don't even have democracy. Um, in this I'll start by saying is independence an act of democracy? Or when we ask it to be liberated or non-colonial non anymore, do we stand to have independence? Or do we still have democracy in Zimbabwe? Because when we are talking about this child rights in Zimbabwe, we need to know that it has been globally realized. So in Zimbabwe, how far have we gone in terms of um, realizing child rights? How far have we gone protecting the child rights of each and every child in Zimbabwe? Let's take, for instance, they're talking about the issue of um, education as a basic right. In Zimbabwe, we have... Um, a lot of children, let's say in the marginalized areas, who are not even going to school, taking cognizance of the COVID-19 pandemic, we tend to know that some students have not even been in a position to go to school, let alone about the economic or financial constraints that they are facing. Education is a basic right, even when we are in the pandemic. We have shifted to digitalization of everything, but then we tend to take note again of the digital divide. How many of the children in rural areas, how many of the children in marginalized areas can afford to be online for education? How many are trained to, to teach online? When we have such violation of rights in Zimbabwe, it shows that we still have a lot to go. We need to calculate a lot of rights and we need to cultivate much for the improvement of those rights. Because you cannot talk about basic education, ignoring the right to be healthy. The Constitution of Zimbabwe in subsection, in section 81, subsection 2, it states that every child in Zimbabwe is, is uh, supposed to be educated. We're plotting it as a um, as a basic right. But then what has the government done to make sure that everybody realizes the right to education? What is it that the government is putting in force? Because in, in most cases, we have theory than practicality. Where we have, um, where we tend to have children being motivated to go to school. But then are the teachers there Taking into cognizance about our economic and financial situation in Zimbabwe, we are it much it is much characterized by strikes. So when we have that, we cannot assure the, the, the country and the citizenry that we are going to be having basic education. Taking it down, we can have children educated, but then what after that? No employment. So we can talk about these rights, not only focusing on not short-sighted. We need to be people who are focused also on the future. What is it that our government has done? Which policies have been framed to make sure that um, employment is created for these generations? Because in as much as we are democratic, and as much as we might talk about independence, do we still have it? Or do we really need to cultivate traits of democracy? We need good governance so that we ensure that rights of these children are protected. We need to have... Uh, let me talk about this, the media. The media is the one that reports to the citizenry, right? They need to tell us current issues on how children are learning. They need to tell us issues on how the economy is being run. But when the, in the, when the media as the fourth estate is not independent, we might not be in a position to talk about basically any rights. According to my own understanding as an academia, I think um, when you're talking about um, the word healthy. It encompasses social well-being, emotional well-being, physical well-being. How far has our own government gone in that sector? How far do we see the government acting to promote healthy conditions for these children? So I would want to say that there is a lot that needs to be done. Thank you.
There is a lot that needs to be done. Democracy does not necessarily mean that uh, children's rights are being protected, neither are, being, are they being upheld. Thank you so much, uh, Helen. Um, and also thank you for touching on the role that the media plays. And I think as we bring to you this program, we are trying to create that environment where we talk about children's issues and where we bring the young people's issues right to the, to the core. Right. When we look at the Agenda 2021, it is about 10 aspirations. I will not go into them, but I want to come to you, um, Stanley. You being in the MDC Alliance, and uh, we have seen over the last few months, if not a year now, we have seen young people within your party being arrested, being arraigned before the courts. We have seen um, the case of the MDC trial in particular, uh, Joanna Mamombe, Cecilia Chimbiri, and Etsai Maroa. And as we are saying that we, uh, six, the 16th of June is the day we commemorate you know, um, young people's activism and we look at our own context in Zimbabwe. I know we're going to come and uh, try to touch on the African uh, continent as a whole because a lot is happening on our continent. We have wars uh, taking place everywhere. How far are governments going in protecting the young people? But I want to bring it back a little bit to you and to bring it back to the level of the MDC Alliance before we look at the broader context of Zimbabwe. Now, when young people in the MDC Alliance are arraigned before the courts and do you feel that the aspirations that are set within the children's charter of the African Union do you feel that these are being met? Oh, thank you uh, my sister. Yeah, when we look at the, um, the young people in Zimbabwe especially from a political point of view you are talking about uh, the arrest, uh, the incarceration of uh, our fellow comrades in prison I feel that it's not only a feeling to the young people of Zimbabwe, but to, it, it, it's a fact that there's suppression for the young people in Zimbabwe. We are, we are not allowed to be heard, our voices. It's like when we are asking a father to, for food, he then beats you up so that you can go and ask uh, uh, from, from a neighbor. So there's oppression. For the young people in Zimbabwe, we are not allowed to be heard our voice. So when you talk of these rights mm. in Zimbabwe, I feel that they are moving at a snail pace, very slow. Actually, we are going backwards. Because when we were growing up, our mothers and fathers used to tell us that even at school, as young, uh, as young children, they used to be provided milk. They used to be provided nutrients, uh, supplements, uh, nutri nutritious foods. But in our days, there's nothing like that. There's only oppression. Uh, 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 the, 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 the young people are not allowed to, to air their voices. They are not allowed to ask. They are not allowed to speak for democracy. Yet uh, we, we, we say we, had, we have independence from 1980. So with all these issues inside the party, it becomes very difficult for a young child because as a party we stand for the voiceless you know it is so threatening for other young people to talk uh, to ask but we come in as a democratic movement to speak on behalf of the young people to speak on behalf of the nation and when we speak that's where the oppression comes yeah. that's where the incarceration comes so it's very, very difficult in Zimbabwe. Mm. Thank you very much. It's very, very uh, difficult in Zimbabwe. Aspiration number two speaks of an effective, child-friendly national legislative policy and institutional framework being in place in all member states. Ostalos. <laughs> Is this happening anyway? We look at Mozambique, the, the, the war that has been taking place there, the beheading that we have seen on social media and on, on international media. Um, we see the, the strife that is basically taking place all over Africa. Do you feel that member states are taking this agenda 2040 seriously? Uh, I, th I think that uh, the African Union by its structure is incapable of realizing Agenda 2060 and Agenda 2040, predominantly and primarily because of the following reasons. Number one, 
I think that the African Union is full of geriatrics um, uh, who, who sets agenda because they won't be there. So no one in the African Union um, is going to account for Agenda 24 to Agenda 2060 because all of them naturally won't be there because they are aging. Um, and you and I even know that uh, we're not in this earth forever. So I think that um, um, structurally the African Union will be incapable of realizing that. That's number one. Then number two, I think that majority of African leaders are preoccupied by positions um, and not issues to transform the African continent. Um, if you look at the current contradiction that happened uh, a few weeks ago uh, in the Pan-African Parliament, yeah. the contestation was never about how do we deal with the invisible enemy called COVID wreaking havoc across the African continent. But the debate was about power. The debate was about the presidents. So, so that is the preoccupation of uh, the African Union. So in my view, because of the fact that it lacks, uh, number three, people who are clear in terms of um, the pathway. And one of the major debates that I felt will be happening in the African Union is that what is Africa's broader ideological persuasion? Because Africa does not exist in a vacuum. We're existing in a global village. If you look at in the case of Zimbabwe, Mtuli Ngube and Zanupefa are pursuing a neoliberal economic order. Right. But it is obviously going to call for privatization of health and privatization of education, which the Charter says must be provided for free. So these contradictions are informed by the fact that there is ideological kwashiok or there is ideological incapacity and vacuum within the African Union. That's why the debate and preoccupation is about power. It's about um, who becomes the president, when are we supposed to be having the election. Number four, if you look at the legislative framework um, in the African continent, it does not talk about how do we create a continental economic block to really deal with the challenges happening. If you look at what's happening in South Africa just a few hours ago, there's a movement growing in South Africa, uh, a xenophobic movement, saying South Africans uh, must resist foreigners and Zimbabweans in particular. So it shows that there is no unity in Africa, beginning with issues of economic relations at continental level. So my belief is that um, the African Union is incapable because it's just a club of detectors. So they can't uh, structure any legislative framework to transform African society because the agenda of the African Union in my view must be about how does African Union or the charter at least at framework level transform the concrete realities of suffering young people and what are the issues affecting young people it's about decent jobs mm -hmm. the international labor organization is clear on the decent work agenda but you won't find the debate and discourse in the African Union or reflected in the charter that's the first question majority of young people are vendors they're aching out a living um, you know through informal sector vending but what happens the governments then structure legislation that is ultra virus the provisions of the African Charter. Because if you go to 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 roundabout and uh, Mbuzi roundabout and Chitungis, government is demolishing uh, vending spaces, but there are no jobs. So for me, also the crisis around how do we ensure that laws and uh, um, you know uh, treaties that we sign at the African Union are implemented in Zimbabwe, you won't find that. So for me, it's difficult to realize and come up with the legislative framework that help, uh, you know, to take young people forward. Lastly, I think that um, you look at the legislative framework in Zimbabwe, our parliament is full of edges across the political divide. Most of them go to parliament to take coupons and sleep. There are some MPs, if you read the report by Open Pan, we have never said a word in parliament. Uh, that clown, um, what's his name, uh, Chiwang uh, Chiangwa, the guy has not said a word in parliament, but you see him with uh, Pashin Jao and all these other clowns, you know, spreading money, you know, stolen money, wealth that is unaccounted for. But you see them all over town giving young people money, but they are in parliament. The guy hasn't said anything, even to say morning, Mr. Speaker, or something that the hand, Hansard should capture. So parliament is full of people who are incapable. Parliament is full of ageist. They don't understand how uh, they should craft craft legislation. They are proposing to give young people 
a, a, a 10 positions in the next plebiscite. I mean, that's an insult because what the major demographic dividend? We, the, we must have an elder's court. That's our position as the MDC because they are the minority. So we must give them something and the and majority of them must be retiring. Look at uh, 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 Chief Justice uh, Malab. He's causing chaos in the judiciary. The guy should, have, should retire and spend time with, with uh, uh, kids uh, in the rural areas. But he wants to be there in the judiciary. So how does the judiciary transform the legislative and legal agenda in Zimbabwe when a Luku Malaba, a candidate of retirement, um, wants to stay there? He wants to be like Tobai Watune, the, the guy who caused chaos in the registrar general's office. He stayed there. And there's chaos up to now. Young people don't have documents. So I'm trying to make you understand how the constitution is more saying when you are 70, you must retire. So I want you to understand how these people who are in charge of the African Union and in charge of our country are incapable by virtue of them being old. They can't be heroes in two struggles. They fought the liberation struggle. They must let us lead the digital uh, revolution, the nanotechnology uh, uh, revolution, the era of artificial intelligence. They must let us lead that revolution. But there is no hero that can lead in two struggles. Thank you. There is no hero that can lead in two struggles. There we are hearing the submissions by Comrade Ostalos, and he's talking about ageists in parliament who are incapable of even speaking or saying a word. We talk about um, the elderly being the ones running our continental borders. Therefore, they are incapable of ensuring that Agenda 2040, let alone Agenda 2063, is achieved by virtue that they cannot be accountable for it, as they are probably won't be of, around. Now, over to you, um, over to you, uh, Stan. Comrade Ostalos has made some very strong uh, submissions around how the system in itself is incapable of achieving this whole agenda 2040 or committing to any of the aspirations that I've mentioned in agenda 2040. Now, when you look at uh, where we are now, what would you say should be done? He's spoken about the need for an elders' quota rather than for a youth quota in parliament because the young people are the majority. Look at us. We are the young people and we are the majority indeed. Now, how do you feel that society as it is today should proceed? Right from local level, before we even speak governmental levels, how are our societies structured and how can we include the young people because if we want to build the africa that we want we certainly cannot exclude this particular generation uh, thank you once again uh Yvonne. like uh, my brother has rightfully said that uh, we are being led by uh, the aging people in terms of structure starting from the uh, local government remember i was in local government there it needs a whole restructuring process we find that the aging are the ones who are at the helm, either at the technical uh, technical aspect up to the lower structures. They are the ones that are leading. But we are now in the digital age, and it's high time the young take up this position so that they can race the race of the digital era. Mm. Why we are lagging in, uh, in, in the local government in terms of... Uh, uh, pipe systems, the road networks. It's because they are the aging guys that are leading. That's why there's a need. That's why there's a vacuum between the, 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 the modern world and us as Africans and us as Zimbabweans. It is because the people that are at the helm are way backwards. And we are in 2020. 2021. 2021. <laughs> 2021. You would imagine. I've looked at the blueprint in council, backdated from 1970 or something. I'm not quite sure. But they were estimating that by 2020, 20, 2010, I mean 2010, there should be spaghetti roads in town. The town should have ex expanded up to a, a roads view there. But you, you look 
at where we are now. This was said in a blueprint at local government. It estimated that, but we are still stagnant or we are actually going backwards. So you find that uh, there's need for leadership to change. There's need for the youth to take up these positions so that they can lead. That's why you find in our party that we have a young president who's willing to take uh, the country forward. And you, when you look at the blueprint of what he's, uh, he's offering uh, to Zimbabwe, and you'll see that we are, it's, it's, it's modern. The spaghetti roads, the, the digital system whereby we identify where pipes uh, go through in town and all that. So there's a very big need that um, we, we, we need to grasp the, the young to take over. The, 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 these leaders should just ac accept that they d they've done their part and it's high time the new generations take over. Thank you. Right, I see Helen, you're itching. <laughs> yeah, I had to. Okay, um, actually, thinking that uh, in the context of Zimbabwe, when you're talking about this child rights and abuse, you know, it is very important for us to talk about citizens' participation. How far have citizens gone? How far has, um, how far has schools gone? When we have a, a lot of students at the same place, how far have they gone in trying to advocate or navigate the challenges that they are facing? Because the moment we are in a position to identify a problem is where we tend to have a policy in the pipeline. So with Zimbabwe now, we might find out that um, the implementation stage of any policy might never be done. So it is very important for the government to actually have um, a policy system or a policy process that reaches to the implementation, that leads to the implementation, evaluation, and monitoring stage, where we actually come to a position where we are like, yes, we have actually come with this policy. Let's take, for example, the gender policy. We cannot talk about this child rights or the implementation of the agenda 2040 when you cannot actually come up with a position to talk about these gender issues. We are from an African culture, right? So we are having a background. So in most cases, I would want to call it westernization of these African cultures. We are trying to come up with an improved structure of governance where we have um, Western cultures. We've been adopting much from our colonial debates you see we have been investing much and learning more adapting policies from them we actually let's take for example this idea of policy of public expenditure systems in zimbabwe what is it that you can say do we have a point where we have transparent and accountable measures into play it is just a talk show where we have our parliamentarians coming in to have policies being discussed far from being implemented. So we need to talk about political will. When you're talking about political will, we tend to know that um, much has been said, but less has been done. So in the context of this child rights, we tend to know that there's a lot that needs to be done. We cannot talk about the child when the parents are not even realizing their own goals. This goes now turn into the rights because if you realize I've been infringed, yeah, I've been denied democracy, yeah, I don't have independence, yeah, you come to a point where you, you actually, you vigor to participate in the policy making systems. So as citizens, I just want to say that um, when you have policies being made, when you have um, laws being passed in the parliament, how far would you have contributed as a person? Because we cannot be talking about our rights being infringed when you cannot actually activate or you cannot actually fight for that policy to be made or right. So particularly when you're talking about this child rights, in the end, we end up talking about the whole nation at large because the same people who are governing these children are the very same people who tend to govern the voters. I want to understand that according to the Children's Act in Zimbabwe, it states that uh, a child or someone who is under the age of 16. Then we have the Constitution stating that a child is someone who's under the age of 18. And we also have other international bodies defining a child under the age of 18. Why is it in Zimbabwe we have that? Why is it we have a difference in defining a child? That leaves a lot to be desired and it leaves, loop it leaves loopholes. For example, let me say judicial loopholes. 
because we need to be accountable for literally everything that we have done. Do we still have democracy in Zimbabwe to actually navigate the challenges that we are facing in trying to realize child rights? So we still have a lot to be done. You're talking about national legislative um, and policy frameworks that are just not in tandem with what we want to achieve. We are talking to Ostalo Stanley and Helen on the day of the African child, today, 16 June 2021, where we are commemorating this illustrious day of student activism, youth activism, the African child rising and demanding their space in society. And um, you have raised um, very fundamental issues, uh, Helen, issues to do with uh, uh, legal frameworks that are not speaking to each other. Uh, Ostalos, you raised issues to do with, uh, what do you call them, geriatrics? Geriatrics, <laughs> geriatrics taking over the whole leadership and they are not in any way moving towards implementing any of the aspirations raised in the children's charter. Um, uh, Stanley, you spoke about policies that have been put in place and even the vision that our colonial administration had, but nothing from the leadership that took over. And you cannot be a hero of two struggles. You did your part. Allow this generation to take the nation forward. Now, as we uh, come to the last segment of our conversation so that we can wrap this up. There's some very serious issues that have um, come out of this conversation and I hope you're taking cognizant as a people, the need for us to participate, especially in legislative and uh, policy formulation levels. What are you doing as a people? We've said we don't vote because the election are, the elections are rigged. Are they really rigged or are you just not taking part? Now, as we round off um, Ostalos, 2021 going forward, what do we need to do? Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think that um, 2021, informed by the events uh, that happened in Soweto, uh, inform us as a generation that we must be able to do the following. Number one, Zimbabwe faces a huge political problem and everyone is looking upon our generation to rescue the motherland. And taking from uh, Soweto uprising, the first and most fundamental pillar of the June 16 generation is that we must be able to be prepared to pay the ultimate price. There is no struggle without bruises. That's why all of us here uh, 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 in the democratic movement, uh, always in courts uh, for trial. Some of us have charges of inciting public violence, treason, insurgency, leading demonstrations, and so forth. It's part and parcel of the service and sacrifice we are giving to our nation as a generation. Because this June 16th generation in Soweto gave, paid the last price for the freedom of South Africans and Africans in general. So we must be able to be pre prepared to pay the price. That's number one. Number two is that we must organize from below. 2020-21, we must ensure that we organize society from below. That's why we're engaged in organic struggles in communities because communities must begin to provide the necessary leadership to transform our country. Number three, we must ensure that as a generation we collectively work together to fight against dictatorship. There is no doubt that Zimbabwe is under a fascist military government. And we pronounce it as young people without fear. And by doing so, means that we are called upon to provide the necessary leadership to deal with that crisis. Because the generation in Soviet was never scared to pronounce the white um, uh, monopoly capitalist racist regime in South Africa for who it was leading to the organizing of the broader movement in South Africa to resist uh, a, a racist uh, Louis Bortha system. So we must be prepared as a generation because there is doubt, there is cynicism across um, in Zimbabwe, and young people 
are asking, what are you doing to lead society towards change? We're organizing society to resist, but cognizant of the ultimate price of what is happening in our motherland. And we can't say all is well in Zimbabwe when there are these challenges. And as a generation, we are being inspired. Our comrades, as I conclude, Makumbra Ruziwishe, are in prison. They are this white generation. They are in prison because Mako is not a criminal. Mako is not a thief. But he's there because he's speaking truth to power. Joanna Mamumbe, Cecilia, and Nezai were abducted and victimized. These are young females who could be having life above the poverty data line in a democratic developed society. But they're fighting for freedoms and rights of the majority of Zimbabwean citizens. Our own commander Obestol was recently in prison. He's out on bail because he's speaking truth to power. So as young people, we are prepared, particularly in the democratic movement, to speak truth to power. And, and I conclude, I want to urge young people that there is no struggle without bruises. We've discovered our mission. We have to fulfill it. Yes, we know there are clowns all over this country, like Pasha and Jawa, uh, misinforming young people that is, it is possible in this country to be a millionaire um, without uh, working and so forth. And that's far from it because you can't give young people crumbs and tell them that uh, you can make it in this country. And they've got their fictitious agenda of mobilizing and uh, lying to the president. And it's very unfortunate because it shows that at the presidency we, we have a problem. And we must resolve this as a generation because we can't be led by clowns. We must be able to be serious about governance. And that's our position as the Youth Assembly, um, that uh, we don't want to be led by clowns. We must be serious about changing the concrete realities of the suffering masses of our people. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Over to you. OK, thank you, my, my sister, once again. Uh, what we should be doing as now as the youth is to, <coughs> to make sure that we mobilize each other, like what the uh, Soweto uh, Orlando Primary School did, uh, Orlando Secondary School did in, in South Africa. We should be mobilizing because what we have, a situation that we have in Zimbabwe is not right. The situation that we have is not right for the uh, for, for, for the girl child, for the boy child, for each and every child that is in Zimbabwe. The child rights, the health rights, the education rights, you name them. We all know them. They, are, they all have been suppressed. So it's high time that we, we, we get ourselves together from schools. You find that uh, at schools... Uh, the, the, the ones that are, are, are benefiting from the scholarships are the same guys that have the money to, 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 to send uh, uh, the, their kids to school. So it's always, uh, it's, it's oppression everywhere. And it's time for us to, to rise as the youth. Like uh, uh, my fellow comrade has said, uh, Ostalos, in terms of uh, Joanna Mamombe, uh, Cecilia, uh, Nitsai, you find Obey, even myself. We have been arrested, we have been uh, in incarceration, we have been uh, done a lot of things. So it's, it's about sac sacrifice. It's high time the youth sacrifice in Zimbabwe. It's high time the youth go and register and vote. We need and to make a look difference. look at uh, the demolitions that are, happening, uh, that are happening across Harare, uh, there are families that are taking, care, are, are taking care from vending. What are going to happen to the children? What are going to happen to the youth? And the government it doesn't have a plan for those kids. They don't have a plan for those children. And uh, most of these kids were surviving from uh, their parents venting, or even those kids venting for themselves so that they can go to school. So there's a whole lot that needs to be looked in by the government in terms of the youth in Zimbabwe. We need to make a difference come 2023. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll actually go back to the aspect of political will and commitment. For there to be change and for there to be favorable conditions that we have been yelling for past these years and decades, we actually need to have that political will and commitment. No one goes to vote without the political will, no the commitment. No one com comes to a point where she actually activates or engage into 
these policy making structures without being committed. So I would like to put much effort on that. We need to have a government that is politically committed than that, that actually advances its own personal wills. Yes, it is that uh, as human beings, we are naturally greedy, but then let actually, let's actually try to be in a position to, to cultivate the needs of the public first before our own interests. And the other thing is for this, for the commemoration of uh, child rights, I would like to say that it is important for the parents first, that is the citizenry, to come to a position where they actually realize the importance of this child rights. Some of these children are not in a position to report because they are succumbed in the African culture where they're supposed to actually respect their parents even in a case of inf infringement. It is also important to denote that um, children must be in a position to come up with structures. Let us, let us have child networks. Let us have children commemorating in this. And uh, we must have children give, given the platform to say and express whatever they have as their own opinions. That will actually tag a democratic nation and a democratic environment for Zimbabwe. I would actually want to add on to say it will be increased democracy for the children as they'll be realizing their rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nothing for the children without the children. Uh, thank you so much, uh, leaders, in your different capacities for joining us today as we commemorate uh, the 16th of June, the day of the African child. I realize as we're having this conversation that this cannot be a complete conversation around children's rights or the African child's rights. We need to have more of these conversations, not just in a studio setup, but in our communities, in our homes. Let's give our children the space to express themselves. That way, we will be able to give them a voice, not just in the home, but in the society, not just in society, but in the whole nation. We need to create those spaces that are child friendly. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today as we had this conversation uh, on 16 June 2021, commemorating the Day of the African Child. There is so much that still needs to be done, more than uh, there's a lot that still needs to be done, more than just putting down policies, we need to start implementing them. And we have a leadership that, that is so excitable and that celebrates ratifying the act, but none that reports back towards the implementation of whatever would be ratified. So we need to start as a citizenry to hold our leaders to account. Where are we? Agenda 2040 has to start now. It's not for us to start in 2040. It's for us to start today, to start now, and uphold the aspirations of the Children's Charter. Thank you so much. My name is Yvonne Muchaka, and I've been your um, host on this particular conversation. Join the conversation. Register to vote. Let us participate in community development initiatives, and let us be part of building the Zimbabwe that we want, the Africa that we want, the world that we want. Thank you so much and God bless you.